recording and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully Ashley's able to join us at some point during our conversation. But we do have Carrie and Ingrid here. So, Tom, I'll turn it over for you to kick us off. Sure, I call the Compliance and Enforcement Advisory Subcommittee meeting to order. Mr. Uh, Paul, we have Carrie, Ingrid, um, Kyle, any other board members in the, in the room? That's it. Julie's watching okay. from a distance, though, yeah. so probably take her <laughs> name down. And then we've got Division of, or Department of Liquor and Lottery is here in the room, and then we've got two members of the public right now. Great. And we also have uh, from the NACB, Mark Gorman, Junior Cranwinkle, Danica Scott. Um, so we're, we got our quorum. We're all set to go. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Happy Monday. Last Thursday, I thought we had a really good presentation and conversation from the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Brandon is here, I think, to answer questions of anybody. I think we were, we were rushed at the end of the meeting um, last Thursday, a lot of information to get in in a very quick amount of time. Um, Department of Liquor and Lottery, again, good presentation. I think they have a lot of capabilities that they could bring uh, to this industry to help us on retail enforcement. There's a couple other perspectives and options that the board could and, and should consider um, when it comes to retail enforcement before we arrive at any decision. I've asked Carrie um, and Dave through Carrie to kind of give um, us a, a, a quick overview of the experience that the Agency of Agriculture has from a retail enforcement perspective. We're working with them, um, or hoping to work with them through an outdoor and indoor cultivation inspection enforcement uh, perspective. So I thought it was prudent to hear how how you might round out that trifecta if that's the decision that the subcommittee and the, and the, the board chooses to go in. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Carrie and, and Dave, and then provide an opportunity uh, for questions from the subcommittee uh, members and, and those Hi, Ashley, glad you're able to join us and um, everybody else on the call. And then Jen Flanagan um, is here. She's with VS Strategies. You're on the strategy side of VS, correct, Jen? I want to make sure I get that right. And no, I'm on the law firm side. Law firm side, former regulator um, at the uh, Cannabis Control Commission in Massachusetts, who is going to give us some thoughts and perspectives on, on how Massachusetts brought a lot of her enforcement team in-house. Um, and then after that, Jen and Tom are going to help us dissect this word security and what that means as an umbrella term um, in this industry and all the different types of um, issues as it relates to security. In my head, it means everything from securing an outdoor cultivation site to, you know, cash management, et cetera, so on and so forth, and how this subcommittee might be able to start um, gaining some steam and some traction on what that word means for this industry in Vermont. So um, with that kind of table setting, I'll turn it over to Carrie. All right, well, thanks, Kyle. And uh, in terms of retail inspections, that is pretty much the bread and butter of what the agency does from a consumer protection perspective, whether that's uh, health and safety on the meat and milk side. Um, we, we, we do the commodities that uh, are grown here in Vermont that don't fall under the health department, so meat, milk, eggs, apples, maple, all that is uh, inspected on a health and safety side, but we're also in in every retail establish, establishment in some other way, whether that's checking scales um, or scanners or products themselves, um, the pesticide feed seed and fertilizer inspectors check to make sure products are registered to be sold in the state. Um, we have, we're in facilities inspecting anything from cream machines to make sure they're sanitary um, to package weights. Um, and all that enforcement is in-house in the agency. So that's very brief and we can go in depth on any one of those. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Dave? And then we went through the enforcement process, which is a administrative law. Um. Yeah, no, I don't have too much to add. Uh, 
uh, from that introduction there, Carrie. Aside from it is a uh, uh, it is a really good I think uh, approach and uh, uh, to enforcement and to regulation. Um, what the Agency of Agriculture does employ, I'm a little biased, uh, but it does seem to work, um, and uh, it it has worked across a broad spectrum of industries and other regulated entities, from gas pumps to Dollar General. Mm -hmm. So scanners, scales, products, packages, um, weights, cordwood, <laughs> you know, all of those uh, things that um, all the consumer protection, anything that has a sort of consumer protection piece where we're there to, to sort of deal with that. Um, the only thing that's similar to what liquor and lottery does in terms of making some making sure somebody is <clears throat> licensed or registered is the pesticide program. You can't buy a restricted use pesticide without being licensed. So we do check licenses. The class A dealers are required to maintain a copy of everybody's license that they sold a restricted use pesticide to, but it's not the sting operation or the tobacco sales issues that uh, that they've been tackling. Um, so similar but, but distinctly different. Um, it's mostly consumer protection, not ensuring that somebody's not getting a hold of something they should. Well, now it's a very quick overview, Ingrid, Ashley, from a from an ag retail enforcement perspective, any questions for Carrie and Dave? I guess, I guess my question is, you know, um, and maybe this will this will span broader conversation. Um, you know, at, at the retail enforcement perspective, there's going to be a lot of IDs that need to be checked whether through your traditional dispensary um, security measures that are going to be in practice at a dispensary um, that's separate from more sting operations um, that, that we heard about um, from the Department of Liquor and Lottery. And Brandon, if I make any mistakes, feel free to sure. interrupt me. Um, just curious if the agency has any you know, similar experience with how they check you know, obviously not, I, you know, I'm trying to think of a way, not IDs per se, but license checks, you know, in, so, in yeah. the more broad sense of what a license is, but but I'm trying to help the committee envision what you would need, not on the resource perspective, we can get there, but, but what kind of training would your staff need on certain aspects of stuff that other agencies, you know, do at certain, from certain perspectives to, uh, to ensure consumer protection here? Well, I think we're looking not necessarily consumer protection like we usually use the term, but the only thing similar is the fact that any Class A restricted use pesticide needs to be sold to somebody with a license. And it is similar to the dispensaries. If you walk into a dispensary in Colorado, they take your license and take a picture of it. Um, same in Canada, they take your license and take a picture of it. So that is similar to what we do, like you need a copy of the applicator's license and a, and a record of that sale. So basically what we're doing when we go to those facilities is reviewing records. It's not a live and uh, it's not a live sort of assessment and similar to what liquor, liquor and lottery does with alcohol and tobacco sales that where the cashier has an opportunity with card or not. Um, this is a Ours is automatic. You need to present that license. The transaction needs to be recorded, and those records are kept for three years, and we're and need to be made available to us. And annually, we get records of all restricted use sales. So there's a lot of catches in there for right. us, and it's largely a record keeping piece. We haven't sent people in and had them try to buy restricted use pesticides. Um, Ashley? Thinking about the meeting that we had last week um, from Brendan and talking about using that data collection 
I, I, I agree with Carrie, you know, photographing licenses prior to purchasing um, is a really great safeguard. I also feel like if we are going to do this data collection, a really great way to fractionate that data is who's selling to people on, you know, under the 25. If, is that a, you know, obviously that would be someplace probably like Chittenden County where there's a lot more college kids. But I mean, that would be then a trigger for, okay, perhaps that's going to be an area that we're going to survey more because we know that there's more people of a certain age bracket that are purchasing. But I feel like what's in place with liquor and lottery, I mean, I feel like the two could really marry each other well. Um, if we're going to be recording everybody's license and their age, I think. Anyway, um, I, I'm trying to pull, pull what we talked about last time into today and use our limited resources of what we have established already with ag, which I, again, think is a really effective way to um, do the seed to sale. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Uh, no, just a minor anecdote. Uh, I, my youngest daughter is uh, 25, born on a leap year, though. And when she presented her ID in Burlington at a bar, they didn't believe her that anybody could be born on February 29th. <laughs> so she waited there while they called the number. Uh, there's a number, apparently, that you can call, and it's a lifetime check of ID. And that's a tool that I think Liquor and Lottery has in place. So if you're photographing somebody's ID for a transaction, the follow-up, I don't know what, what service that is or, or how it's done, but uh, that lifetime tracking of is an ID real um, is probably a tool that could be employed. <coughs> Dave, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you, Kyle. I just wanted to piggyback on uh, something that Carrie was talking about there. Um, the Agency of Agriculture does have a quite a, a rich tradition of licensing, uh, in addition to checking for licenses. Uh, in fact, we we license pesticide applicators. Uh, so, for those who are going to be applying pesticides, they have to come and take an exam, and then they receive a certification from the agency that allows them to go out and apply pesticides on other people's properties. Uh, so we not only have to verify that the person taking the exam is the person who really is working at that company and also will be receiving that license. So it's sort of ingrained in staff, not even in a field agent perspective, but at the agency of agriculture, check IDs anyway, uh, because we don't want to be giving the wrong credentials to somebody who is going to potentially have uh, you know, a pesticide is an economic poison is how it's defined. We want to make sure that ends up in the correct person's hands. So even from the get-go of the agency, it's checking identification. On top of that, there's certified applicator record checks. So anybody who is going to be a licensed applicator is going to, and this is where Carrie was heading, uh, is going to also have to be uh, inspected to make sure that their record keeping is up to date. And so once again, the agency's field agents will be going out and taking a look and making sure that the applicators are utilizing their licenses appropriately. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, and I was thinking as you were talking, the only thing similar that we regulate, similar to a controlled substance, is are those restricted use products. Everything, all our other retail inspections are for other things, quality, um, you know, we'll candle eggs to make sure they're fresh. We'll inspect maple syrup to make sure it's labeled at the right grade and at the right density. Um, all of our other components are really um, consumer protection and quality control, make, making sure they're the right grade. And uh, in addition to that, you know, while we don't do uh, sting operations or undercover operations in the same sense that uh, liquor uh, control might do. Uh, we do have uh, a history of just being the consumer for enforcement cases and purchasing the product at, you know, city market, healthy living, uh, doing the same sort of uh, uh, techniques that any uh, citizen could potentially do. Uh, and then we run lab samples and make sure that the products are going to be having that guarantee or 
uh, making sure that that apple that's being sold as organic actually is organic and is not uh, uh, something that is going to be a non-organic sold as an organic. Hey, I helped rewrite the local definition when I was at the agency of ag, so I know a little bit about how that all works. Uh, <laughs> Ingrid, I see your hands up. Yeah, I think there's a question for you, Kyle. Um, just for clarification, uh, I should probably know this already, but are we, first, there's room for different entities to be doing different components of enforcement, correct? Like we're not, yeah. we're- Yeah, thank you right. for, and I can clarify. So, you know, within, within 164, it's, it asks the Cannabis Control Board to, to seek out and utilize all existing you know, agent, uh, sister agency expertise, and I think that kind of gives us a broad charge to explore partnerships with different agencies to make up, you know, everything from inspection and enforcement to other facets of this program that are outside the, the purview of this specific um, subcommittee. So I see a scenario where the agency of Ag could help us. Are you, I guess, Ingrid, to zone in on your question, are, when it comes to retail enforcement, are you are you asking could we use both Ag and DLL for that or yes. okay yeah I think I think if we could yeah. figure out a way to to cleanly uh, I want to hear if you have an idea on how to cleanly separate out the word or separate out the concept of retail enforcement or what you're what you're thinking um, I guess I was thinking in the context originally that we could um, you know agency of ags using or we're gonna hopefully move in a direction the subcommittee voted on to help with outdoor and indoor cultivation um, I haven't tried to parse out retail enforcement inspection in my head, but if, if we want to do that, I'd like to hear what you're thinking. Um, I guess I was just thinking in terms of like this consumer protection or quality control type aspect versus, you know, more of the enforcement and compliance. I mean, they're, they're obviously interrelated, but it, so far, as I'm listening to this, there's just different emphases, like uh, so what like these folks are talking about. Are, so like shelf you know, life stability of a product, and if it's still safe to sit on that yep. storefront shelf, could we utilize the agency of ag there and maybe fall yes. back to DLL when it comes to sting or undercover operations or some, some combination there? Is that what you're thinking? That initially, that's what I'm thinking. And also, you know, things like, I mean, the pesticide thing, and I don't know from beginning to end what it all involves, but it's obviously incredibly important. And I don't know what, you know, DLL could bring to that that aspect of this, but. I kind of, um, yeah, you know, and I kind of view that issue more on the pesticide dealer that Ag already has jurisdiction over and, and that application yeah. of that pesticide, which, agriculture would help us from a outdoor cultivation and indoor cultivation perspective but I certainly could see the expertise that ag might have when it comes to what that product looks like from a consumer protection perspective on a on a shelf and how long that product should be on the shelf before it it no longer is is viable for consumers Carrie I don't know if you want to chime in at all no no you got it and that's sort of I mean, I'm falling back on the, the previous, um, the governor's Cannabis Control Commission report that sort of broke that somewhere at the retail level that the um, Department of Liquor and Lottery would deal with licensing and they already have the infrastructure to deal with towns and local zoning and uh, illicit sales. Um, we took, we currently list, list, offer all sorts of retail licenses and we inspect those retail facilities, but not at the sort of level of criminality. And I know like the dairy team goes into some of our medical facilities now to do inspections. Is that true? <clears throat> they have a license with dairy because they're offering butter. Okay. And butter is a dairy product. Right. So they do have a dairy processing license. Okay. Um, I was just thinking of, of other peripheral <laughs> ways that the Agency of Agriculture is already working within this broader market. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. I can see, I saw a lot of head shaking when Ingrid kind of <coughs> proposed that idea. Seems like that might be a direction that the subcommittee's heading in, at least extending retail enforcement to the, the product itself to the Agency of Agriculture and leaving more of the purchaser, consumer perspective, um, charging the board to work with um, DLL to try to come to some, some type of understanding. Ashley, I see your hand up. I just wanted to take the opportunity to echo that, and I think that that's a really smart approach. I think that we've also seen now five years worth of pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals being tested both on the medical side and also on the hemp side. So we know what to look for. We know what's common, especially you know heavy metals being a big one as the plant is a bioaccumulator. So I think we have a lot to work with as far as how to keep people safe okay. um, on the pesticide, herbicide, heavy metal side. So I think agriculture or ag is definitely equipped for that. Tom? Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with the comments and questions. I just wanted to take it back. It's, it's the same question I've had throughout this process. And the background of it is, I mean, it's the same front question I had, or what I was trying to ask for enforcement and, and DLL. And the background for my question is, from the agency perspective, um, what you're seeing nationwide, including with the USDA, uh, with, with their HIP program, uh, sorry, the question's always, because I've, I've spoken with, with some USDA representatives and they've been pretty frank and honest and said, listen, we've laid out the program, but we, we do not have the capacity um, to do the enforcement and the investigation that, that we're saying is required. And so that's what I'm trying to determine um, when we're talking to these other, other agencies. So, I mean, Carrie and David, if you could give me like an, an idea of, you know, what your marketer, what are you dealing with, with now? Um, and then my, you know, my question last week for DLL, you know, they're able to break it down to, yeah, each, each investigator or, or agent is, is dealing with X number of licenses. And then I'm trying to envision how is that going to, how much more are you going to be stretched um, when we're asking this particular agency or whatever respective agency to do even more once, once adult use comes online? Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, Carrie, and, and I can I can phrase that with you know I think everybody's wanted to see what the size and shape of the market will look like with this October report that the, the control board will be giving um, to the legislature. But if you can speak to your capacity now, how that might change from a, a resource perspective once once we all understand and have a little bit more direction. Um, I'd rather sort of hold off answering based on. I mean, we've heard from Liquor and Lottery, they've got a mandate to inspect every tobacco facility. We don't know what the mandate here is. Is it every facility once a year or is it every grow? So are you in that facility every eight weeks or are you in there annually? So until we know what the charge is, I can't really talk about what level of resource, what the level of resource need is. Okay. We have, um, Dave, do you know how many Class B dealers we have? I don't have my computer in front of me. Not off the top of my head. Um, I don't know how many Class B dealers there are, but, you know, anybody who's selling off mosquito spray, uh, you know, is, is someone who's applying a pesticide. Yep. Um, and not only that, we, every retail facility, every retail facility is licensed every scanner, every gas pump, and we have, we cover the state with four inspectors, but those gas pumps are only inspected once a year. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, and I can, I can do some research offline and talk to Tom and, and VS, others offline from a, I don't know what other jurisdictions are doing from a retail compliance and enforcement perspective of the product itself, not the sting undercover operations to see if a business is conducting itself appropriately from a who's actually buying it but of the product how often you know what's the shelf life typically it's, i know it varies de depending on product but it can be months to about a year for for some products what would be a prudent 
amount of times you would have to visit each retail establishment to make sure that that consumer protection. Yeah. Um, I'm interested, not to cut the conversation short, but uh, Massachusetts keeps this in-house under yeah, the board? Yeah, it's a good segue. Um, yeah. Jen, I know that there's a lot of decisions that you likely made at the beginning that, that in trying to work with your fellow sister agencies in Massachusetts, and I know it was some it's my understanding it was some work to get it all in house, but if you could kind of, you know, walk us through why certain decisions were made, um, especially as we consider resources and how much capacity other agencies might have, it's going to factor into that cost benefit analysis with how the board here does certain things. So, sure. Um, the one thing that I will say that is different between Vermont and Massachusetts is that we were not required to work with sister agencies on anything. There was a stress of we should collaborate as much as possible, um, and we did that with the Department of Public Health, the Department of uh, Public Safety and, and Security, the Department of Agriculture, um, in ways of guidances and public awareness campaigns and, and the, the like. But when it came to enforcement, we as a commission, and, and for those of you that don't know, I will, I will give you a very small snippet of what it was like in the beginning. We were five people in five cubicles with no staff having to create regulations in um, the span of two and a half, three months. And so the decisions were created and made by the commissioners. We had advisory boards through the Canvas Advisory Board. Each one of those subcommittees presented to us once on what they believe were important to be in the regulations. But you have a much more extensive subcommittee advisory board type process than we did. and so. The decisions that were in, and also um, by way of background, each one of our commissioners had to statutorily have a specific background. So we had a public health, public safety, finance, social justice, and regulatory commissioner, one in each of those areas. Um, and I think really what happened was on day one, each one of us kind of went into our silos and said, all right, I'll take the public health issues, which, is, which came under my realm. Commissioner McBride took the public safety issues. Commissioner Title took the social justice issues. Commissioner Doyle, who had written um, the medical regulations, was a resource to everyone. Um, but one of the other obstacles we had is that we had to operate under the open meeting law. So everything we did was in public. Nothing that we did could be behind closed doors, um, which as a former legislator, that was my favorite place to be. <laughs> Those were the best negotiations that we ever had. Um, so having said that, we felt it was important to have enforcement and compliance under our agency, the Cannabis Control Commission, because we knew that as regulations changed, our enforcement team could be brought up to speed as quickly as the regulations were changing. They were there in real time. Um, when I tell you that our enforcement team is, a, is amazing, we took a wide range of people we had um, inspectors that came from the gaming community, from housing, from the food and beverage industry. Um, you name it, we encourage people to come and apply at the commission. And so what you have now at the Cannabis Control Commission is a number of inspectors that have a wide background. Uh, and we, we capitalized on that. They are able to talk. They're very mobile. They're across the state all the time. For, in, for terms of inspections, um, you're inspected twice before your licensure and then once to twice annually after. However, if there are deficiencies and the investigations have to happen as to what exactly, what compliance or enforcement regulation that you violated, then the, 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 the whole process plays out at the commission. And so one of my biggest concerns would, it, would be that if it was not under the Cannabis Control Board, is that now you're piecemealing, right? So now you have someone who might come from agriculture or someone who might come from alcohol. They're, they're looking at specific entities. Others are looking at the other ones. What happens to the enforcement if something goes wrong? Um, I know that we talk a lot about uh, protection of the consumer. We're also protecting the facility. We're also protecting the product. It's not necessarily all about the consumer because in Massachusetts, we have a provision in our regulations that says you have to share your security plan with law enforcement. So the local fire and police departments know about the layout of your facility. What if you're doing extractions? What if something goes wrong and the fire department has to go in? What if you know um, the security cameras 
are malfunctioning on the outside of the building. You have to have 24-hour recordings that are saved for up to 90 days that law enforcement can ask at any time. Uh, we do have a secret shopper program, and so we can send anybody into any facility on any given day um, to try to obtain products. Uh, and when it comes to the IDs, in Massachusetts, we, we have to show our IDs multiple times when you're in the dispensary. You've got to show it to get into the dispensary. And then, just as you do in a bar or a, a club or whatever, you can be asked for that ID again at point of sale. And so one of the biggest concerns that I had, having worked on our gaming legislation and having worked sort of in, in the alcohol legislation that we had in Massachusetts, is that just because the technology gets better, does, does the way that the fake IDs are happening if you don't look at the person, the technology is just really looking to see if they're in a database. And so look at, we wanted people to look at people to, to know that that's the person that's trying to enter the facility. Um, we don't keep any type of identifying information. And so we, we may keep your age and your date of birth and your gender, but we're not keeping who you are and where you were at any given time. There was a really big concern that people didn't want to be put on a list which is one of the reasons why some people didn't want to be on our medical registry. They didn't want to be on a list that was at a state agency that they felt they could be outed and that people would know that they're on the, on the list. Um, so for us, enforcement and compliance really was a big piece of this because in Massachusetts, the only establishments that are limited are dispensaries. So each city and town is allowed, allotted 20% of their liquor licenses to then come in and be cannabis dispensaries. Um, we don't limit cultivation, we don't limit manufacturing. Uh, we have a testing license, obviously everyone has to have the products tested, and we also have a research license. And so um, those aren't even limited in scope. Uh, so as far as compliance and enforcement, really we wanted, to, we wanted to own it. We wanted as a cannabis commission to own it because we understand that unlike agriculture or um, or liquor, we have a lot of obstacles with the federal government given that this is federally illegal. And so we want to make sure that we kept good records, that we were ensuring that this product was, you know, in the vaults, away from the general public. You know, if you had limited access areas, there was only a limited number of people that could get in. We do check and inspect uh, all of the IDs for the people who work in the in, in any of the establishments uh, because you have to have a vendor registration card. And so all of that is put into um, a database that, that our enforcement team can go in and check. Ashley? That was amazing, first of all. Thank you for that. Um, and how many dispensaries do you currently have in Massachusetts? Oh, when I left, I don't have the number off the top of my head. I can get it on the website. We have an open um, platform database uh, in Massachusetts on our cannabis control website. But ballpark, I want to say maybe like 100. I don't, I wouldn't know. Um, I know that when we started in 2018, they sort of came fast and furious. We also had medical who changed to do both. And so they were operating in one building. But. Not everyone has, act, not every city and town has maxed out the number of dispensaries that they're allotted. And we as a commission made the decision that if you're a small town and you have two liquor licenses, we'll give you the one dispensary. Or if you have three liquor licenses, we'll give you one. Um, we really didn't, we have a mandate in our statute that we can't exclude by zoning. And so we didn't want to exclude because a small town doesn't have the capacity to have a large number of licenses. Our liquor licenses are at the local level, and the cannabis licenses are at the state level. Jen, Jen, do you do you also know how many growers and processors there are? Oh no, not at the top of my head. No, no, not even close. No, nope, I guess question was wrong. Do you register or track those at, at the commission? Oh, everyone's tracked. Everyone yep. that gets a license from the Cannabis Control Commission is tracked. Yep, I do. Um, they all, whether you're a micro business, craft cultivator, small business, to the hundred thousand square foot indoor grows that we have, mm -hmm. everybody is tracked. Okay. And so for outside, when you talk outside cultivation, which I know Vermont really wants to 
to prioritize outdoor cultivation. Um, the one concern I would say is that you're very limited because of we live in New England and our climate isn't the same as it is out west. Um, but you have to have secure facilities. You have to have fencing around this. There needs to be um, video cameras. Um, one thing, because it's federally illegal, if you have children, minors that are working on your farms, they cannot work on that part of the farm. So if they're under 21, they're not allowed to be on that land. Uh, no one under 21 is allowed in the dispensaries unless they're a medical patient with their caregiver. Um, until you're 18 that you're allowed to be your own caregiver. I will tell you that we also have a provision in our um, regulations, which I really think we were trying to be pro small business, is that if you can't conform to the regulations that we've established, then you need to come up with an alternative plan, ask for the waiver, and also talk to the local law enforcement. Um, so if, if you think you can't afford what we're making you do or you can't do what we are asking you to do, then you can tell us that there's an alternative that is just as safe and you, you have to prove it. And again, the, the process is to not only protect the public, but it's to protect the product, it's to protect the business. Because at the end of the day in Massachusetts, and I'm assuming the same is gonna happen in Vermont, you have to reconcile the scraps compared to the plant that you're using. That weight has to be reconciled. Everything has to be accounted for at the end of the day. We also have a provision in our regs that if you don't sell up to 85% of your product in the six months preceding your renewal, we'll drop you down a tier. Mm -hmm. You don't get to keep the same tier because we don't want the extra product out there not being sold. Jen, I think, I think you hit a, um, well, it's, I want to be cognizant of the time. It's 2.38, I imagine we might have some, or 2.39, I imagine we might have some some public comment, but maybe um, I wanted to, to just say one or two things, and then maybe we can move into how we can best start attacking a lot of the concerns that you just raised when it comes to security um, around a lot of facets of this program and how we might start being able to attack that in, in small small chunks on starting on on Thursday. Um, but quickly, I wanted to say, you know, I think it might be in the best, um, it might be best for the board long term to try and bring as much stuff as we can in house as possible just for a lot of the, the concerns that you raised you know in the short term I think it's it's challenging um, because we would have to go to the legislature to request more positions and we need regulations ahead of you know hopefully by what Thanksgiving looking at David <laughs> and we can't go to the legislature until January plus you know the way everything is supposed to work out we need to pay the operating expenses of the board with fees collected on licensing so the more positions we create the more expensive licenses could get so you know there's a lot of things to weigh and consider as we look to make relationships with other state agencies it might not be the cleanest um, for the board um, but we can install hopefully some safeguards to make sure that it doesn't take away from any consumer safety or protection um, you know, facets of what we're trying to do. Ashley. If, I just wanted to ask quickly, I, I really appreciate how flexible and nimble your crew is. Can you just walk through what like a typical enforcement would be? Would be? Like, for instance, like, I, I'm not sure if Delta 8 is illegal in mass, but like when something as quickly as the legislation just change for something like that after it's already been released to the public, like what sort of chain events happen to make sure that those sales are not happening? That's hypothetical, but. So any type of regular, any type of legislative mandate would go to the Cannabis Control Commission. Mm -hmm. And we have options because our regulatory process is a year long. So we wouldn't be able to change the regulations as quickly as we would be able to have the executive director establish a guidance or establish you know, a mandate, which he did quite frequently during COVID. I mean, we had protocols that were put in place every time something happened last year during COVID, um, even to the extent when the governor shut down the adult use cannabis dispensaries. And so we have those type of actions that we can take, but when our inspectors go in, they're looking at everything from grow rooms to documents, to financials, to there's a checklist that they have that they're gonna go in and, and look at from there, they're allowed to talk to anybody that they want. They are even allowed to subpoena at the end if there's really big problems that they see. Um, you might be, have seen in the news or you can certainly Google. We've, we levied some pretty hefty fines on some of the businesses for certain things that they've done. Um, the one thing that I will say is that because 
the Cannabis Control Commission in Massachusetts did not need legislative approval for anything. They, we were able, we were given the authority to create the, to create the agency and set the program. We have gone back to the legislature to ask them to do certain things, but they have not turned around. The Delta 8 issue, quite frankly, that's going to probably be a conversation between the Department of Agriculture and the Cannabis Control Commission because in Massachusetts, hemp is controlled by the Department of Agriculture. So determining what happens at a federal level, because I don't think the state has taken that on yet, um, or my former colleagues in the, the House and Senate, there can, that can be another one of the collaborations that we have, right? So, for instance, when I say we've had collaborations, um, we had an OUI commission, uh, and we had to look at operating under the influence. It was a 15-person commission. We collaborated with the Department of Public Safety and Security, the executive office. We have mandated public awareness campaigns. I personally headed up that for the CCC. We collaborated with the Department of Public Health, substance abuse portion of that. So. We've had collaborations. I know that the Department of Agriculture worked very closely with Commissioner, former Commissioner Doyle on the environmental side because she had a lot of environmental work that she did in the beginning. Um, but those grew naturally from things we had to learn. Like there was, we had no playbook. Quite frankly, as commissioners, we called everybody else in legal states and said, what'd you do wrong so that we don't do it again? Um, but I will tell you that the one misconception a lot of people have is that once the regs are in place, they'll never be changed. We, we had to set our regs by Christmas of 2017. For the next two years, we went into two rounds of reg changes. Right. So for three years, we were changing regu we were creating and changing regulations because we didn't know what we didn't know when we got appointed. So the, the Cannabis Control Board in Vermont is going to set their regulation. There's nothing to say that's going to be set in stone for five years. Right. If they find a problem, I assume they have the authority to go in and, and change those regs later. Ashley, uh, if you wouldn't mind asking your question, if it's if it's quick, just because I want to be cognizant of, of our time. Um, thank you. And it's just a quick anecdotal. Um, you talked about collaborating with the local police force to protect the facilities. We are insured, and to be insured, we needed an extensive security system, um, of which, um, fortunately, I'm actually the only one who has set it off um, a handful of times. And um, we have created a really lovely partnership with our local police officer like, for that, um, getting here quickly, uh, making sure we're all safe, making sure that it's not put into a stigmatized category or not showing up at all because they feel like they don't need to show up for a CBD company, but um, I just really love that collaborative spirit and I just want to echo that sentiment that that sounds really wonderful and it sounds like the best way to move forward here to utilize all these wonderful programs that we have in place for Vermont. All right, well, well recognizing that, that the model Massachusetts launched might be this perfect <laughs> model for Vermont, but recognizing it might not be practical for us at this point in time at least. It sounded like that we were building to a consensus where the Agency of Agriculture could help us on the retail end of things from a product perspective, but the Department of Liquor and Lottery, um, we should, the board should work with them um, from a um, consumer protection perspective when it comes to um, licenses, so on and so forth. And I can get some more um, specific language written up for our next meeting, um, but I just want to make sure that that seemed to be a consensus that the, that the whole subcommittee um, would find a prudent direction for the board to pursue. So I think one way that you could, you could make that work and marry sort of the agencies is that if there is a specific training to the cannabis regulations once they happen, right. then it might be easier for the inspectors from Ag and Liquor to go in and look for what you're asking them to look for. Because yeah, absolutely. Your regulations could be very different than what they're what they're used to. I don't think we're intending, if through partnerships, to put everybody out on an island. I think we would still try and. Uh, maintain some continuity um, in-house and making sure that people are talking with each other and sharing information. Um, um, maybe we can we can plan to vote on that first thing Thursday if I can get some language written. Um, 
uh, that might make sense for how we've decided to parse this retail enforcement. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm fine with that, Kyle, but um, you know, in the end, we answer to the same boss. Um, at the top, the agency of ag and the agency, or the Department of Liquor and Lottery. And the presentation I heard was they're busy, they're strapped, and they have very limited resources already. So before I support, kind of want to hear if it's something that they're willing. Um, yeah, and okay. You can reach out once, once more. Because um, we, we did hear what they can do, but I don't want to support something that they're not willing to do. Okay. That's all. Okay, well maybe, I mean, considering that it might be, you want to see the market structure analysis before you vote on this, is that <laughs> what you're saying? Or just hear from Liquor and Lottery. Um, I know a previous uh, deputy commissioner was enthusiastic. Um, I don't know what the temperature is at the Department of Liquor and Lottery at the moment. Could I ask you and Skylar to, to give us your, uh, recognizing we gotta do a lot of resource understanding of what might make sense, but to speak on Thursday briefly if it's something that you have the capacity? Yeah, I can get with Skylar and see if we can come. I mean, I think our overall stance is that we are, would be super supportive of, of what you all are talking about at this point, where we would break it up a bit between Ag and us. And that um, you know, I think he had some. Skyler had some conversations with you and, and James about you know that we would want to see the number of licenses and stuff like that before we could commit sure. to saying you know how many extra people we might need or if we would need any extra people and that kind of thing. So okay, yeah, I can, that, that's can. all. I just didn't want to support something that a sister agency was not willing <laughs> no absolutely I don't want to I don't want to volunteer anybody to step into the quagmire with me uh, <laughs> unless they're fully willing to go there um, great well, well we can make some progress on this Thursday I'm very hopeful for that um, we've got only a couple minutes Jen and Tom I'm, I'm thinking what might make sense with our few remaining minutes is start to unpack this security word what make what would make sense for the the subcommittee to talk about on thursday as a starting point recognizing we're going to start writing regulations over the course of the next two months and we've got to get licenses out in a certain order where should we start from a security perspective um, to inform those regulations i mean i i think you need to really start thinking about what physical things that these um, establishments are going to have to do. If you're talking outdoor grows, do you want fences around it with you know, locked fences with cameras? Do you want motion censored right. lights? Do you want, I mean, you just start to think about how you see these facilities um, would you be willing from to, a perspective of. Would you be willing to on Thursday talk about outdoor cultivation and security and indoor cultivation and security if, if and what, what happened in Massachusetts and, and Tom and Mark, if you might be willing to do a, a broad scan of, of regs and other states and jurisdictions and we can start to unpack a little bit about um, what that looks like elsewhere and what might make sense um, for Vermont. I think that might be a good way to progress on Thursday after we kind of hopefully can get some, some buy-in and support from our sister and partner agencies on the retail enforcement end of things. Sure. Thank yep. you. All right, it's 2.51. Comments? Yep. Um, hi, it's Dave Silverman. Um, so uh, last week there was this great article in Leafly about burner licenses in, in California and it got me started to think uh, about um, security in a different way. Uh, these are licenses, these are like, uh, the equivalent in Vermont would be the wholesale license where uh, they had product coming in from legal growers but then they were leaking it out to largely out of state uh, uh, parallel markets. Um, and they, they were doing this by sort of just like losing cannabis off the books. Um, and uh, it turned out that the state, California, didn't really have any sense in their seat to sale tracking system of, of just how much cannabis a particular wholesaler could store. Uh, so on the books, they had, you know, so, so one of these licensees had 
you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds of cannabis in, 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 their, uh, in, in their like 300 square foot office uh, with a safe that held, you know, 30 pounds max. Um, and so it, it just occurred to me as, as you're thinking about uh, security regulations, it, it would be nice uh, if uh, licensees who were going to store cannabis on their premises, um, you know, would report to you not only on how much they take in and out, but uh, how much uh, realistically they can securely hold in their compliant facility. So, you know, if, if you, you know, have them report to you, like, you know, the size of their product safe or something like that. And that way you could actually use the seat to sale tracking system to, you know, automate some processes uh, to see when things seem to be leaking. Um, I think that would be a, a useful security tool. And, uh, I, I don't mean to get a, maybe deeper into this than, than you might be ready to, but uh, you know, it, it might be a more interesting and more effective way to ensure security than just kind of layering on more cameras, more fences, and things like that that, you know, will just add a lot of cost and might not necessarily, um, you know, protect anyone. So thanks. Thank you, Dave. Nick, Ben, any comments? Any further comments? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, we're, we're running somehow ahead of schedule. Dave, I see your hands up. Actually, your hand is still up. I don't know if it's still up or new, uh, but we do have a couple minutes to continue. Um, Dave, why don't you start, and then Ashley. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, and Jen, thank you very much for your presentation and, and all those uh, questions and, and uh, your answers that you provided. I have one more question, though. Would you be able to answer Tom's question that he had posed originally to me and Gary uh, about how many folks you have investigating, inspecting the type of resources that are necessary to run this. Uh, I assume that you did a market analysis on your own, and that's where you wound up with doing things internally. We did not do a market analysis. We, we've we grown this in four years. Um, in fact, the commission has just put on another cohort, if you call them, of inspectors. And so we've We've been continuing to hire for four years. We started off, I want to say, with uh, when we were in our, our makeshift offices, there might have been six of them. And I want to say now there's over 20 of them um, that are in the inspection uh, and enforcement department. We have an enforcement um, chief, though. We have someone who is the chief of the enforcement department. We have an attorney who's the assistant chief, and then all the enforcement officers and inspectors come under them. So it's its own department, sort of siloed from other things. And there's a pretty big firewall between the enforcement department and the rest of the departments at the CCC, given the sensitive nature of what they do and, and, and things like that. Um, we honestly were not sure what, what it was going to look like in Massachusetts. And quite frankly, when we were appointed on September 1st of 2017, we literally put pen to paper and heads down and started to create. We didn't have time to do any of the analysis that Vermont is doing. Um, we didn't have a process that we reported to anyone. We literally, I want to say in terms of finances, we received, I want to say two to three rounds of supplemental funding from the legislature before we got to the next fiscal year budget. Um, and that literally was because we had to find office space, we had to hire people and, and what have you, create an agency. Uh, the resources that they have, they have cars, they have, um, I want to call them tough computers that they use. I think you often see them in police cars as well in cruisers. They have those, they have now all the PPE that they need to go in and, and inspect anything. There's a training process that they go through with the CCC, um, the details of which I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, and so they are their own entity. They, they do their own thing. Um, and it really, it came about as the market got bigger, we knew we had to hire and we had the budget to do so. So they are all state employees of the Commonwealth. While they work for the CCC, they're all state employees. Um, and they are made to be completely mobile if they have to, um, but they do have workstations at the Cannabis Control Commission in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, their cars are tracked, there's GPS on their cars, there's what have you. We do not have a state police component like the, the Alcohol and Beverage Commission does in Massachusetts. So there is no law enforcement um, that's part of the, there's former law enforcement that might be working there, but there's no law enforcement contingency to it. 
Thank you, Jen. Ashley? I just wanted to say how much I appreciated Dave's public comment. Um, I saw that article as well, and I think that we are maybe a little bit, a few steps away from really honing on, on that particular issue. Um, I just don't want to gloss over it, so I want to make sure that we all uh, read that article. I'm happy to share it, circulate it with all of you, and take that particular aspect of things into consideration because. I don't know that we all think that way um, about product leaking and how are we going to, like, would we weigh it? Would we then weigh it again? Um, and I don't know, Jen, to put you on the spot, if that's something that you guys read or have considered or if you've had any issues with. You, have, Like I said, you have to reconcile everything at every point. All of it is documented so the Cannabis Control Commission can see it at any given time. Um, when it goes from a cultivator to where it's going, it's all tracked. When it goes from the dispensary out, it's tracked. Um, as part of our seed to sale tracking, we know at any given time where anything is. So I, I will say that we have pretty tight control over what happens in Massachusetts. Um, and the goal was so that if anyone had a question, law enforcement, you know, the, the legislature, the agency, anybody, then we could go back and collect the data um, to have that information for any given department. Um, but the one thing that I will say, and I know that you probably all know this as a subcommittee, the board, the commissioners have a very difficult job in the fact that while you have multiple subcommittees going on sort of simultaneously, but on their own, they've got to reconcile all of this at the same time. So as they're thinking of enforcement, they're thinking of the market, if they're thinking of you know public safety, consumer protection, um, they have a pretty hefty job as they're listening to what's going on in the subcommittees to be doing sort of in the back of their head, trying to put some words to paper and get these regulations done. Um, it, it'll be very difficult to meet deadlines if it's being done in pockets. Thank you, Jen, for making my Monday a lot more, you know, feeling Sorry. like a Monday. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> that was our four, that was our three and a half months when we got to the commission. It yeah, was. absolutely. <laughs> um, well, thank you everybody. I think we'll, we'll come on Thursday, um, hopefully with getting some more direction on retail enforcement and, um, and starting to crack this nut of, of security and what that means here. So appreciate everybody's time. Um, thank you, Jen, for joining us. I'm looking forward to having you, um, helping guide us um, with your experience in Massachusetts on this committee and and I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting today. I'll motion move. to adjourn. Second. All right. Thanks everybody. It's 259.